Welcome to another episode brought to you by Imagine Strength, the future of safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. Are you a hit studio owner looking for equipment that's not just top-notch, but also tailored to your specific needs? Imagine Strength is your answer. Inspired by the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength is revolutionizing the hit industry with their state-of-the-art yet affordable equipment. Their team doesn't just sell hit equipment, they live and breathe it. I've personally experienced their gear at the Resistance Exercise Conference, and let me tell you, it was an intense workout that I won't soon forget, in the best way possible, of course. So why choose Imagine Strength? Number one, they provide customized solutions for hit studios. Number two, they have budget-friendly yet high-performance designs. And number three, they're committed to innovation and excellence in high-intensity training specifically. Founder Jeff Turner and his dedicated team are on a mission to make HIT accessible to everyone. Getting started is easy. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, consult with their expert team. And number three, choose the equipment that will skyrocket your business. Don't wait. Head over to imaginestrength.com and elevate your HIT studio today with Imagine Strength. Lawrence Neal here, and welcome back to High Intensity Business, your one-stop shop for elevating your hit business and fueling your passion for high-intensity training. This is episode 434, and this is a special one for me. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with my mentor, David Pike, a seasoned entrepreneur and huge inspiration to many. And David's journey started with over 25 years of hands-on experience in the food and beverage industry. And David's journey began in the bustling cities of London and Portsmouth, where I am from in England. Uh, where he ran family-owned cafes and restaurants. His commitment to quality led him to source the finest food and beverages, a principle that guided him as he transitioned into the fruit juice and uh, coffee supply sectors. With a global perspective, David has traveled extensively to places like Florida, Israel, the USA, and Germany to ensure he was working with top-tier growers and suppliers. David's expertise caught the attention of Jacobs, a large coffee producer, excuse me, from Germany, leading him to market a new coffee product in the UK. His diverse clientele ranged from hotels and restaurants to sports clubs and universities. Eventually, David sold his business to Dow Egberts, part of the American conglomerate Sara Lee, um, very well-known large business, and pivoted into the dynamic world of recruitment. David is now the founder and managing director of Jefferson Maguire, an executive search firm with a razor-sharp focus on client needs. Jefferson Maguire has a proven system for identifying and recruiting top-tier talent across various industries, uh, David also owns Executive Warrior Health and Fitness, a venture aimed at helping executives regain their youth and fitness. Uh, and earlier in his career, he founded Right Associates Employment Limited, an employment agency that he built from one employee to over 40 before selling it to an American staffing company. It was at Jefferson Maguire, David's executive search firm, when we first met back in 2009. That was almost 14 years ago. Um, I came to work for David as a business development manager, trying to bring on more roles for the recruitment team. David, you are a massive inspiration to me, and I am very excited to catch up with you today. Well, very pleasure to be with you. <laughs> and, you know, I'm thrilled to do this as well, because as we were saying just now before we started recording, there's not enough, there's not enough on you. I know you're, you sit there, you're writing a, a memoir or a, a book about your, your life, but there's not enough on you in terms of content on, on the internet, on YouTube, about your story. And... Um, it just just is such a huge inspiration to me that I'm I'm feel very fortunate to be able to be one of the first to record something with you and put it on the internet. <laughs> yeah. So look, um, what do you let's should we talk about where we first met and start there? Um, I thought that might be a good start to this. So, do you remember when we first met? I do remember when we first met, and uh, I felt sorry for you, and um, <laughs> I didn't. But, uh, I was I I had a branch in Fairham. And I advertised and you, you came along and we used to meet before the others used to come to work and we used to have friendly chats. Um, I know you were keen on basketball at the time. And as you may remember, one of the incentives that I, that when you did a good month, I bought you a basketball, which you plan to stand you still have. I do. And that's a nice memory. You can look at the basketball and think of me. <laughs> I do. It's uh, it's. It, I did know. I I did play basketball recently because I live in a little cul-de-sac estate where one of my neighbours has an actual basketball hoop out the front, and they're really cool about me just using it. But it sounds like a terrible excuse with the two young kids and the way life is or woods. It was very difficult to find time and energy. But I did actually go out there recently and just shoot around. 
but I use my other ball. I use my outdoor ball because a special ball you got me is an indoor ball, which is currently in the shed and uh, well, needs to be. For Fifteen years. That's pretty good. What's that? Kept it for fifteen years. Yeah. So. Oh, oh, well, it's a great, but great ball. I mean, it's got sentimental value. But it's also just a really high quality basketball. I'm very grateful for that. Um. So yeah, you you re inspired me because um. I was a bit disenfranchised with my job at the time. I was working for an IT company in the same building. And uh, you really inspired me. I'd heard stories about you from a guy I worked with, obviously, Mike. And um, I was like really inspired by your, your background and stories about you. And then obviously I found out you were in the same building. And then we met with Katie. Um, I think we met in one of the local buildings in Cam's Hall. Like the, it was like a clubhouse or something. Yeah. Um, I think we had lunch or something like that. And then that was obviously where we spoke about the role. And then I come to work for you. And um, to put in perspective for the, the the listeners, I was basically sales, making sales calls to businesses, trying to get roles. I wasn't very good at it. But David did everything in his power to try and make me good at it. <laughs> but it was, the, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a very successful time, but it was um, uh, just huge for me in terms of personal development. So you would you would really encourage me to get in early. How early were you getting in the office back in those days? I don't know where we still. Yeah. I still do. I still do. Get here, I get here at seven o'clock. I was getting in the office at seven o'clock. Right. Okay. Was it seven? I thought it was even earlier than that. No, it was seven because my background, as we might go into, is is, is based on family business cafes and and the cafes that I used to run used to open about half past six and seven. And so I'm I'm an early riser. So I, it's just a habit that I've that I've always kept. So I'm an early riser. I cycle to work in the morning at seven o'clock. Can you take us back? Let's go there now. Take us back to the beginning with businesses. Can you kind of just tell us that story, like how you got started? Well, right from the very beginning. Yeah, if, yeah. If you if you may, yeah, if okay. you can. Okay, my my granddad on my dad's side, and my grandmother on my mother's side. Had these workman cafes. They don't. They're not around anymore with them, and uh, they were only small, maybe I don't know, twenty or thirty seats. When I when I came out of the RAF, I came out. I went in the RAF early when I was eighteen. That's our RAF for the American listeners, Royal Air Force. Yeah, oh, Royal Air Force. Yeah, yeah. And I was I was booked to go to Loughborough University just to do become a PE teacher. But then, in those days, you had to do your national service first. So I went in at eighteen, uh, and then while I was there, I met my future wife. So I decided I wouldn't be a teacher. I'd get into business. So when I came out, I took over one of the cafes uh, in London, the Great Bridge Road, a little, tiny little cafe for workmen. And and uh, I stayed there for four years, up in the morning, getting there to, to, to light the boiler for the workmen to come in. So I, I, I worked there for four years, which is about one member of staff. And then they were about to put the motorway through my premises. So I then had to look around for somewhere to go. And I had, I had three little kids then. So we used to come down to the beach at Hailing Island. And I thought, if I could find a business at Hailing, it'd be lovely. And there was a new development in Portsmouth. Um, and it was, um, so we took a, took a, a, a U, one little unit. And I'd never been to Portsmouth before. And it was still got bomb damage. And people said, don't go to Portsmouth. Said, it's a depressed area. Anyway, I took a unit. And like everything that I've always done, I want to be a bit different. So Portsmouth, it was still recovering from the war, if you like. So there was bomb damage everywhere. Wow. Having come from London, there was a, there was a, a company out there called Golden Egg, quite a flashy modern with its sort of place. So what I did, I copied their menu. And they, had, they had these menus on wooden boards. So I copied all that, put it into this unit here. And my mum and dad, and my young brother, who was only 16 at the time, we went down to open it up and nobody came in for, 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 for a day. So what we did, we, we put our, took our coats off and sat in the window as if we were customers. And then people hardly ever go into an empty restaurant, but when there's people in, they go in there. So people started to come in. And then a few months later, I took another unit. So we had two units. And then I took another unit, so we had three units. Then I took another big unit. My parents were on holiday in New York because I bought another unit. So we had four units and we turned it into a 200 seater restaurant and it became the busiest restaurant in Portsmouth. It was fabulous business. Um, and that was, that, that was the beginning of my, well, no, I suppose the, the Bridge Cafe in, the, in London was the first one. So the Richmond Grill, it was called, um, was very, very good. 
uh, but it didn't occupy my time. It was, it was sort of self-running, if you like. And I got into playing tennis with this guy and he was selling a product from Holland called Raz Potato Powder. So I thought, oh, let's go into business with him. So I went into business, apart from still running the grill. So I went into business with him selling this potato powder and this was 1977 and it was a, there was a shortage of spuds. So we, we went round to all these places um, and put our potato things in. And um, I was coming home from a Hotel Olympia, which was an ex exhibition then, and there was a place called The Happy Eater. So I said, let's go into there. And I said to the guy, I said, who supplies you with um, potatoes? So he gave me a list of, the, of this, this, the bot of this company, who was a big, powerful sort of guy. So I got an appointment to go and see him. Uh, and he picked this demonstration in front of him and his wife and the board of directors. And he said, Does, who else uses this product? Maybe he just shouldn't hear this one. I said, well, there's a restaurant down in Portsmouth, I think they use it. It's called the Richland Grill. And they're very happy with it. They said, well, do you think you could get us an appointment there? I said, I'll try. <laughs> so I then told all the staff, I said, look, you don't know me when I'm going to get this person down. <laughs> so I put on a suit and I introduced, I said, look, this is the chef. And they said, what do you think of this product? It's a wonderful product. Talk to the head waitress, a girl called Trudy. What do you think? Oh, it's a wonderful product. Our customers love it. So anyway, as a result of that, I got all the Happy Easter businesses with about six of their, their roadside restaurants and another one called Welcome Break. So that's how I started getting sort of busy in that. And then what did happened? They not found, did they not find out that you owned no, the rich? No, no. <laughs> My staff were very discreet. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, so then what happened was, Obviously, the price of potatoes went down because the, the heat wave was over. And so we were selling a product. There was no market. So I, think, so I thought, I've got to get another product. So the guy that was the Norwegian-European distributor, he had a place in Alicante in Spain. He said, come and stay with me. I said, okay, we'll go down there. I was looking for another business. So I went around to various businesses. I went to a shoe, fa a shoe factory, see my import shoes. Then I found this juice company. I thought, this is a good idea. I don't know anything about juice, but I'll tell you what, I'll buy a barrel, two barrels of the concentrate. So I had the two barrels of concentrate sent over to a little place I'd taken in uh, next to my, my restaurant and it was concentrate. So I didn't know, I didn't know what to do with it because I didn't know how to pack it. So I found a packer and I started selling it to the people that were buying my potato powders. Uh, and I, and, um, but what I didn't realize was that the. The juice needs to be in a container, not in a plastic thing, because it started going black. So I very quickly had to go get, get a, so I then went to Israel to find a supplier to do. So I found this company called Medi Juice. What made, you, what made you think to go to Israel? Because my main competitor, my main competitor was a company that Mokama owned actually called Jaffa Lux, and they bought their juice from Israel. So I oh. thought, okay, I copied them. So I went to Israel and I said, I wrote to the Israeli embassy. And they said, well, what, what could, I said, well, all the growers in Israel, please, could you give me their addresses? So I, I forget how I did it then, because there weren't, there weren't faxes. I, I don't know how, how I got, there weren't emails, but anyway. Yeah, said, long before internet. Ten of them, and none of them wanted to talk, talk to me. I said, well, we, we, yeah, you're not too, you're too small for us. There's nobody, there's nobody. Um, but there was one company called Medijuice and they said, okay, can we come and see you? Not knowing that I had a restaurant. I said, yeah, okay then. So I met them at Portsmouth Station, a guy called Zami and this guy called Mr. Lubinsky, who was the boss of this juice company. So I took them to the Richmond Grill and we sat down there and they gave me some sample cans and they said, well, what, what do you want to do? I said, well, I'd like to become a big distributor. Yeah, but you, you, haven't, you haven't got any just, I said, well, you just give me a chance and see. So, they, so I ordered a container of fruit juice from them. It was concentrate, six to one concentrate. And I started selling that in squash clubs. I, I employed that, uh, I, I put, I employed a guy up in the north who was a very good seller and we started putting it in because at the time fruit juice was just sold as an upper before meal meals in tiny little glasses. So mm -hmm. we converted them to drink pints of this fruit juice. But then, then I wanted to get in the biggest caterer at the time was a company called Trust House Forte, biggest company. So I wanted to get into them. And, um, the first place I want to get was their motorways because they supplied all the motorways. So I happened to have a, phoned them up and had a good relationship with the buyer. And he said, well, look, we'll try you on a motorways, or the fleet motorways down here. So I went down there with this guy from David Rothwell and we sat outside and they, 
their sub- current supplier was a, was a Florida juice called Golden Gem. So these buses were coming off, and we had white coats, and we were comparing the flavor of their juice with our juice. And of course, we persuaded them to like our juice. And a little bit of manipulation, they preferred our juice. So we then got the Trust House 40 motorways, which was quite good. But that was only part of it. I wanted the, the best place was there, was there, was there, was Heathrow, the Heathrow that was selling 2,000 ounces of juice a day. Heathrow Airport, was it? Or? Heathrow Airport, yeah. Yeah. Luckily, the guy that was running the motorways got transferred to Heathrow. So a little bit of manipulation there with a taste and tell. So I got Heathrow. That was a massive business. Mm. And then we had an exhibition in Brighton, and I, I love exhibitions and chatting. We also got Gatwick Airport. And at one time, every airport in the country had my juice. And I, and I it calculated that every 10 seconds, somebody was opening a can of my juice. So it was brilliant. Wow. So we went up. And I went to Florida, obviously, to, 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 to the suppliers and, and that was, that was nice. And then I got a call from this German company, Jakobs. Yeah. And they said, oh, sorry, I mispronounced that, didn't I? <laughs> Thank God. How did you find out about that, by the way? You sussed me up quite well. LinkedIn, David, the internet. It's a powerful thing. <laughs> yeah, there's that thing about me now. There's all about me. Did you tell <laughs> that? So it, anyway, got yeah. this guy called Dirk, Dirk is and he was a, he's a Dutchman working for the thing. He says, look, we're looking for a distributor for our new coffee system, which rivaled Mokomat's liquid coffee. And they said, we're talking to a lot of people. We're doing the Coca-Cola, so and so and so and so. But as you probably know, I'm quite enthusiastic. And I sold him to use us. So he said, okay, we've got, their, head, their office was in Zurich. So I went to Zurich, took my wife to Zurich. And um, she, she was doing a Jane Fuller thing. Who's minding all your kids during all this? Um, well, we put them out in a, in a, uh, uh, well, how old, how old were the kids then? I'll be older at that point, well, I we guess. Got, we had a big, big support system. Um, well, I have a mum and dad and, um, got it. Okay. Uh, so I went to Zurich and I met this guy called Mr. Jakobs, a very, Mr. Mr. Klopp, while well, he was the boss of Jakobs, very wise guy. I picked up a lot of ideas from him. So we, we started selling their, their coffee to all the people that we had the, the juice business. Uh-huh. Unfortunately, the machine st- started going wrong and Jacobs wanted to get out of it. So I said, what we were, what we were doing in the juice business, we were taking all Mokomat Jaffalax's customers. We were taking all of them. And at the, I had a thousand machines out all over the country. But the problem was these machines cost a thousand quid. And I, I was buying these machines and all I purchased with personal guarantees. I was guaranteeing everything. And did that. A lot of money to go and go and guarantee it. So yeah. I wanted really to plug the business on. And uh, I started talking to various people. And then, and then Sarah Lee came on, which was Mokomat. And a guy, I met a guy two, three years before who was the boss of Mokomat, uh, the issue of directors. And he said, David, I want to buy your company. I said, well, it's not worth very much at the moment. I'm not selling it. He said, well, I could put you out of business. I said, well, go and try it. But instead of putting me out of business, I was putting them out of business by taking all their because we had all these outside. Uh, you get one like, hey, people that supply IBMs. You get one of those, and you got all the salesmen in order taking my juice. Mm-hmm. But so two years later, I said, I got this. I said, well, look, make me a decent offer, and I might sell the bit anyway. We had long conversations, and um, finally, I sold it. I sold it for a million quid back then. But I that's a lot of money back then, right? It was a lot of money back then, but I didn't. Right. Know. A lot of it didn't hit my pocket. So I had to pay all the debts for these machines that I had. So, uh, so I sold that, and then, and then. Can I just can I just stop you one second, David? You, you just have this like relentless passion for like acquiring, growing, selling. Yeah. What is it? Do you, do you ever sit back and think what makes you different? Because you well, you just it, don't have, you have like no fear. And I I'm just just want to stop there for a second. Yeah. A bit of a shrinking violet, and I don't really know. I don't know. I, I was, I was always pretty cocky when I was at school, and people used to think, "Oh, he's cocky. He's going to do this." And my, my mum used to call me Walter Missy. Now, Walter Missy is a. Have you heard of Walter Missy? I, I have. There's a, they did a recent a new movie about that actually. Well, it was a movie with Danny Kaye. Who was I? I don't know the original. Movie. Yeah, was a dreamer. He used to think, "I want to be um, a pilot," and he, he saw him driving this aircraft. 
aircraft plane and then he wanted to be a hair, hairdresser. So he was a famous Paris hairdresser. <laughs> well, not to call me Walter Mitty because I'd always dream this. So I've always been like that. Not, not deliberately, but it's just part of my, my nature to be. So they did a remake with Ben Stiller. They did a, in, within the last 10 years. It's a very good movie. Yeah, yeah. It's a good movie. We yeah. watch it and you, you can see me in the film. I'll film. think of you. Yeah. Okay, so go on. Sorry. So anyway, so I was still running the Richmond Grill and uh, I was playing. Um, no, I, was, I, that's an, I, sold the, I sold that business mm -hmm. and I was running the London Marathon. I was running the London Marathon with a guy that owned a shop next to the Richmond Grill in Neil Portsman. And uh, we started running the London Marathon, and uh, his his girlfriend was in recruit. And when I when I sold my juice business, forget serious, I sold my juice business. And although I was working at the grill part time, I took a year off. And in that year off, I was keen on mountain bike, and I used to go on my mountain bike. But I got dead bored. I got dead bored. So I got the Financial Times. I read to this guy that had bought manpower an entrepreneur that bought manpower and I thought maybe that's quite a good business to get into. So I thought, okay, let's go into business with this girlfriend. Of the... So I started getting into business with this girlfriend, but she didn't think I was contributing enough. So she said, I, I don't want, I don't want you as a partner anymore. So okay, then I'll buy you out. So I bought her out and then I took a big premises in Ports and took, and that's how I started building, building, um, right. Well, associates, right. Yeah. I was, and I opened, I opened a branch in, in Southampton, in Basingstoke, in Poole. And then, and then I was approached, I was approached to, to sell that. Um, so we went through a process and we were turning over four, 15 million, I think, about then. Wow. So worth quite a bit of money. So I, was, I sold that. And um, then where was I? And you made a lot of people successful along the way, didn't you? I know so many people, either I've met, People really? who told me about others who have like, yeah, you know, there's people that have got who worked for you who have gone on and started their own search firms and recruitment yeah. firms and like made millions. Yeah, many. Well, maybe I maybe I should get some commission from them. <laughs> you should. <laughs> you should <laughs> reach out. <laughs> when I sold um, White Associates, um, they said you can't use the word. You can't use the word White Associates anymore. You got you got to change the name. So I thought, what should I call it? So I went around to various people working. I said, well, let's have a contest to choose a name for my new company. But none of them were any good. And at the time, Jerry Maguire was a film. Yeah. And his, his secret is showing me the money. I thought, well, that's a nice, that's a nice name. Clinton was the pre president of the United States. And his middle name was Jefferson. So I thought I'll put those two together called Jefferson McGuire. So that's what I called Jeff. That's, <laughs> that's, that's amazing. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. So anyway, so that's, yeah. that's where I am at the moment. Uh, my other business, which is um, Right International. In fact, I've got a new website. Have a look at it tomorrow. It's going live tomorrow. Rightinternational.com. It's really, really good. And I'm, I'm helping promoting that and do a lot of the marketing. Is that G Gary, your son, still yeah, Gary runs that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In fact. Um, yeah, they got a new website and the guy did a website said, why don't you put your picture on the website? I said, because I don't want to put my picture on it because it's Gary's business really. Yeah. And if I put my, he said, I, I said, I compare myself to a swan. Gary's the swan at the top. So he's, he's doing very well, then, getting all the praise on the feet underneath with, <laughs> with the business going. So I don't, I don't want publicity from myself or writings. But you I make didn't. it sound like Gary's not doing any work. I'm sure he's oh, working he's very it. hard. Yeah, very, very good. He's doing very well. Very, doing very, very good. That's he's my only son, but he's a lovely son. I've got four daughters and a son. So that's about where I am now. So, but then on my fitness side, because I'm a fanatical fitness person all my life, I've mm -hmm. been a fitness. When I was, when I was 12, I sent off for a course. This Charles Atlas had an advert, people kicking sand in people's faces. And it was, a, it was a, so I didn't offer it when I was 12. My mum says, you're mad. I said, no, no, I want to be, I want to be, I want to be very fit. I don't want to kick people's. So it, it, all this, all this stuff was almost the metrics. Okay. So it, it, muscles. It, so I started doing fitness. And then when I was 18, um, there were no gyms in the country and no gyms at all in the country. But a company called Universal Fitness opened a gym in Kingston. 
So I joined up and I went all this chrome stuff and pretty curl pits. This is amazing. Nowadays, they turn a penny what is these sort of kids. And I started, I started doing that. While I was, when I was running the British Cafe, going back years, I used to go off at lunchtime to a guy in a place called Hamwell. He had a little gym in his stuff. And I used to do workouts there. And I used to be squatting and doing that. So I've always been keen on fitness. Always keen on promoting fitness because I know what beneficial being fit is. Because you can have all the money in the world. If you haven't got your health and your fitness, it's worthless. It's nothing. And, you, mm. you know. I always say to people like, who, who was it died recently? Um, somebody died as a multi-billionaire. I said, do you know how much money you left? He said, no. I said, all of it. <laughs> yeah. That's meant to be a joke, by the way. Sorry, sorry, David. <laughs> Straight with my head, though. I just... leave all the money. Well, what, you know, what's it good to all the money if you're in the bloody graveyards? Yes. Then I thought, I, I know what, I'll try and spread <laughs> the fitness. So I thought, I've got this website called executivewarrior.fitness. And it's a nice looking website. And I thought, mm -hmm. I've never promoted it. Uh, and, and virtually hardly anybody knows it's there. But sometimes when I talk to clients, I'll be like, I've got another side of my business. It's not just headhunting. I've got this other side. So a lot, of, as you know, a lot of people are, are interested. And maybe as yeah. a result of this podcast, people might get interested in some of the stuff. Other maybe, stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so that's about where I am today. Uh, yeah. You know, it, David, if I might just say, I... I don't know if you remember this or knew this, but before my business is called High Intensity Business, but it's registered as Corporate Warrior Limited. Oh, is it? Yeah. And it used to be called Corporate Warrior, right. which is very funny because yours is called Executive Warrior. Yeah. It's just very similar. And um, my original plan, I guess, was to serve the busy professional with exercise, right? And, 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 the content I was providing back then was all about, it wasn't just fitness, it was productivity, it was lifestyle. It was trying to, um, trying to help, you know, it was like self-improvement for the busy professional. And that's kind of evolved and changed and all niched down since, obviously. Physical self-improvement. Physical, but also productivity, like, you know, how to be more productive in your work life. So you have more time for other stuff and, and you can more output, that kind of thing. And um, I just think it's funny that, you know, we had this a very similar business name or we'll focus there. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Well, go, going back when, when I going back to when I was running, um, I was in Cairns Hall. I'm, I met that guy called Dan Kennedy. I don't know if you've heard of Dan Kennedy, but yeah, the internet marketing Dan Kennedy. He's a guru. He's you met him. Wow. Um, and he was talking about doing um, newsletters. Yeah. And it was years ago before. It, so I started doing a newsletter. I thought, like, what can I write about? And I just heard about this Japanese guy called Tabata. Nobody had heard of Tabata. So I thought I wrote a newsletter about Tabata, which is, you would know what it is, you know, yep. 20 seconds on, 10 seconds. Yeah. I've got an assault biker in the gym and it's got a Tabata and I'll do, I'm going to do it this afternoon, in fact. But nobody heard of Tabata. So once again, before my time, if you like, now everybody talks about HIT, everybody talks about Tabata. Oh. You have Tabata workshops, you have all these sort of things. It's a bit like Pilates in a way. Now, years ago, Joe, Joe Pilates invented this system for dancers. Now, they bastardize the word Pilates. And they do all sorts of Pilates. They do, they do Pilates on bloody uh, surfboards now or, or on paddle boards. It, it, they think, yeah. I mean, basically, Tabata was the original HIT thing, which now it's developed. And, and it's, as you know, it's, it's, an excellent, it's an excellent part of overall training. Mm -hmm. part, of, part of overall training, not the be all and end all. So, yeah, so that's... Key point that. Yeah. That's, that's a bit... So, I, as you know, I'm, I'm talking a lot here, so... I You're fine, make, David. What you want? <laughs> I love it. I, I love just letting you go off and just, you know, right. ask okay. questions here and there. Well, okay, one of the, one of the, one of the things that I, uh, I've said before, because my wife is of age she is, and because the class of the people that she, that she teaches and my daughter now teaches, a lot of those... As I told you the story about they when they get there, oh, we can't get up, we can't get up, we've got to use our hands to get up of a chair. Then after a couple of sessions, they can get off a chair and they real, realize they can. Now, as you know, it is that they couldn't do it. It is that they believe they couldn't do it. And once you get into their mind, they can do it. That's 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 the thing. It's getting to people's mind. Like for instance, I've seen a person walking by there's got a huge great belly, about fifty inch waist, and I think He's not going to live very long unless he changes his mind. I think his family's going to suffer, his wife's going to suffer, his kids are going to suffer. 
Or you see, sometimes you see a mum and a daughter, big, big women, and the little kids are big as well. Four little kids got no chance. It's going to be because that's the food they put in. So all this thing about exercise, you're going to lose weight, is really hokum. The only way you're going to lose weight, as you know, abs are made in the kitchen, as this is the phrase goes. Um, <laughs> and that's true. Yeah, it, yeah. I'll go off then. I do go off. No, not at all, David. This is fascinating. Um, but maybe I can just interject with a couple of thoughts. Uh, just things Ooh. I wanted to make sure we talked about when I work with you. You know, you... Uh, so, so for those listen, long-time listeners might remember um, the Spartan Health Regime, which was uh, this very romantic um, e-book all about like, you know, it was, it was fitness and lifestyle and diet that was um, inspired by the Spartans. It was probably romanticized a little bit and maybe not completely historically accurate, but it was still really great. It was a great catalyst for me um, yeah. in terms of my start. Because um, when I came to you, I was into training and I was into playing basketball and fitness and I was kind of getting more into diet, but not really. I wasn't very knowledgeable about it. And then you really helped me sort of start to think about this stuff and inspired me. And I remember you wouldn't eat. So you'd get in, uh, get into the office for 7 a.m. And you would only eat fruit, right? What would your diet be? And is it the same now? I'm curious. Well, yeah. Okay. Now, I did not wishing to bore you, but my, my regime is, is, is this. Every Definitely. month, every Monday, I fast all day, 24 hour fast. Okay. okay. Um, I, I never eat breakfast. I had my little, I had my little blender here, and yeah. I, I had my little protein meals in here. <laughs> I have every day except Monday when I don't eat at all. And then when I, I normally I had salads and and but I, I am trying to I'm trying to lose about. I used to have a phrase I want to lose ten pounds. I had a girl working for me called Ellie when I was at Rice. She said, "Dave, is, is that the same ten pounds you tried to lose last year?" And I said, yeah, it is the same thing. <laughs> I love that round. And there's a little bit more to go now. So that's that's my regime at the moment. Um yeah. the trouble is my daughter in cook who lives next door always cooks a lovely roast dinner on a Sunday night. So once Sunday night, I eat too much, and that's why I fast on a Monday. But no, I don't fast just because of that. And obviously you got you, you obviously know you've got to drink a lot of water. Sure. Every morning, every morning, my first drink in the morning is green tea. Is that matcha? Yeah. Okay, got yeah, it. Green cities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a very healthy, I mean, people say to me, you know, I don't look what I look, I don't, and I say, well, okay, but really, I'm not exceptional. It's these other people that don't do it are exceptional, because there's people, you know people, I know people. Yeah. In fact, I've got a picture of a guy here, a picture of him, he's 81, and I've got a picture of a really lovely looking physique. I've got a picture of David Coggins up there, and I've got a picture of me 40 years ago, with a body that almost similar to that now. I love that you are still inspired by people like David Goggins and people a lot younger than yourself. You, I would love it, David, if after this you took a photo of your what you're looking at, so we can see your inspiration. Yeah. That would be so cool if you're comfortable with that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. we can maybe we could put it on the blog post. Okay, I'll send you. And what I would send you a picture of is, is my gym. I'd love that too. Yeah, I've got a wonderful, wonderful thousand foot gym. Nice. I've got. I've got a concept rower. I've got the assault bike. I've got a treadmill. I've got weights. I've got this wonderful bike I've just got called a Watt bike. And I'm going to edit a week. And it's, I, because I've been out of training for, because of my accident for eight weeks, um, it's been difficult last week to get back in it. But last, yesterday I did an hour. And I, today I'm going to do another hour. And I'm going to do a Tabata at the end of it with that, on that assault bike. Yeah. Thank you. But I remember you used to sit there in the office and you just have like, and I know, Diets change a little bit since, perhaps, but you always just have like an orange or like a piece of fruit on your desk, and that was it. And it was like, and it was the same every day. The discipline, whether or, whether or not you know it's bright sweet fruit in the morning, or you've changed and improved that, it doesn't matter. Right? Okay, there you go. He's got an apple for those listening. Um, it's just that it was the it was the it was putting me in the right direction, you know. Oh. And I was exposed to that every day. Um, and so that, and then what you would do is, I remember you'd work, you'd start at seven. But then you'd finish early, right? You'd finish like 1 or 2 p.m. And then you'd go cycling up Portstown Hill. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Um, and for those listening, Portstown Hill, hill right next to where I used to live uh, or grew up, is a pretty steep hill. Um, and it's a pretty challenging cycle. And you would do it every single day. And you were in your what, early 70s? I used to cycle from home to, to the opposite, uh, to the Bothy. Right, okay. Cam's rule. 
Yes. Yeah. Let's talk about it. It's 12 miles. And yeah. David also used to have a very nice Porsche, uh, which I used yeah. to kind of en- envy uh, that you used to drive into the office every day. But we, as we spoke about before we got recording, you're now free of that. And uh, it, I love your relationship to possessions. You're really not impressed by any of that stuff anymore, are you? Yeah. The Shinar Twain says that doesn't impress me much. <laughs> Today's episode is sponsored by Imagine Strength, the game changer in safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training machines. When it comes to HIT, Imagine Strength is your go-to for intelligently designed, efficient, and affordable equipment. Their team is passionate about HIT, and it shows in every piece they craft. So why are Imagine Strength the right choice? Number one, they tailor-make their equipment for HIT studios. Number two, they provide cost-effective solutions for your business. And number three, they are committed to ongoing innovation and refinement. Ready to take your hit business to the next level? Visit imaginestrength.com to discuss your needs and find the perfect gear for your studio. Join the hit revolution of Imagine Strength and transform your workout experience today. Um, I'll tell you what's interesting speaking to you. I've got no idea of the influence I had on you. Oh, yeah. I've got no yeah. idea. Yeah. And it's rewarding to hear that. Um, and, I, and I'm sure, as, as you pointed out, I'm sure there's, I know there's quite a few people that have been inspired by me and people say, I don't mind, I don't mind having done that, but I'm not too, a bit, um, not nervous, but embarrassed, but if they tell me. Really? Yeah. David, you've been this, you've been out. I'm, 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 I'm I'm really super, a normal person, really. Yeah. If you can spread the word like that. I've always had this like huge sense of self-confidence and belief in yourself. Where does that come from? I guess, I guess it comes from the fact that what is the genes or not, I've always, I've always been quite successful in what I've done. When I was at school, I, I was always top of the class. We used to have, a, when I was at the primary school, we used to have about 50 kids in there. As you go out at the front, and they should read the results of that. And the top boy and girl would just sit in the top corner. And my goal was always to sit in the top corner seat. And I did always, always. Then I passed the exam and I went to a wonderful, a big influence on me was my school called Hampton Graham. It's called Hampton School now. That was a wonderful, wonderful school that extended you all the way. They had a big, big, they were very into physical training. And, I'm, and my mentor was a, a PE master called Mr. Foster. And I used to go to rugby matches. and. Watch, and he used to bring his family. He had about four little kids. I thought, when I grow up, I want to have four little kids. Like, just like him. But we ended up having five, so we, we beat him to it. So, <laughs> so I, I, I've always been in, I've always had, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you the, one of the major things, and you'll agree with this, I read a lot. I read so much. I read all the inspirational stories. That, that I, you know, I never read a novel. I never read a novel. All, all the books I've got, in fact, he was a big influence for me, Dal Carnegie. I went to Dal Carnegie. Yeah. The Golden Book. That's old. Yeah. Is that before How to Win Friends and Influence People? Yeah, that's another one I've got stuck on my computer. Oh, okay. Obstacle is the way, run holiday. Yeah. He's a yeah. young man. He's younger than me. And do you know what? He's so prolific, isn't he? Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> yeah. You were showing me the coin. Do you want to show you the coin again? That well, reminds you of death. I've got sweet coins, all from Roland. All from Roland. And this one is, okay. this one says, you could leave life right now. Okay. What's it? Uh, Memento Mori. Is that it? Is that what it says? One of them's a... You're a better knowledgeable from my life. I know, David. I do my homework. Brainier than I am. Uh, I doubt that. <laughs> this one says, Amor Fati. Okay, yeah. Not merely to bear what is necessary, but to love it, which is your job. I love that. I love that. This one is called Obstacle is the Way. The impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. And the last one I've got here is summum bonum. Mm-hmm. This is true. This is true. Mm-hmm. Just so that you do the right thing, the rest doesn't matter. Love that. Coins I've got from my holiday. I love these. How do you get these all on this website? You can just buy them, can you? Yeah, you know, yeah. Oh, I might look into that. I could do with some more. I'll do my desk and I'll take them home at the weekend. What do you think? You may remember this. Were you there when I got all these worry dolls? I can't remember. Maybe. I I know you had random stuff on your desk. 
I said, don't worry, give me the, yeah, I've got one here. It's, it's, I, th I forget it's some Asian sort of philosophy about not worrying and you have a worry go, so I'll put that on my desk. Not that I worry anyway, but it's just, yeah. just nice to, to have that. Do you want to see something cool, David? What do you think of this? Oh, Scott, mate. Where'd you get Yeah. That? So a friend of mine, my best friend, uh, Stuart Ralph, uh, he, who has a very successful podcast, by the way, called the OCD story is huge. Um, he, uh, he, he's a big fan of you because I talk about you all the time yeah. and, uh, I, I told him you were coming on the show and I was telling him about you the other day about how you're still the same guy. And he's just like, that guy is such an inspiration. Um, well, and he, I know I'm getting you, I'm embarrassing you now. Um, but he, uh, no, he knew that about obviously, so when, when you gave me Spartan Health Regime, I was fanatical about that book and I implemented everything in that book to the letter. And I shared it with him and then he implemented the whole thing. I shared it with a bunch of friends who became like, you know, when you read it, you can't unread it. You can't unlearn it. It's so profound. And they all, they all changed. Um, that's the, that's the ripple effect you have, David, or, or anyone can have if they're, you know, in, inspirational. I the guy, the, the, the boyfriend or the husband of go to work for me. And he got inspired and he did this, you know, this race to Sable in the Sahara Desert. You heard of that? Uh, not really, no. Oh, it's, it's, I don't know. It's about a week's long and they, 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 they can't have any support and they run in the Sahara Desert yeah. uh, for, for about three or four days in a row. It's, it's deadly. Anyway, he joined that as a result of reading that book. Oh, wow. Amazing. So, so this friend of mine, Stuart, he actually bought me this because obviously he was passionate about the Spartan movement. And it was kind of a reminder to say, for me, it's like, it's I have it on the desk to say, yeah, to say it's like, my desk, I put it in my desk. And it, it's, it's to say like, when things get hard, it's like, who are you? Like, suck it up and get on with it. It's like, you used to look at me, David, when we worked at Jefferson McGuire, you'd look at me and you'd shake your fist and you'd like, give me that stern look. Oh, would yeah. I? But which was, but it was like a look of like, you can do it. You know what I mean? It was that type of thing. And even, uh, this is my finest funny, like I got, I got pretty emotional, obviously, before we were recording, because, you know, we were talking about stuff that's really dear to me. And, um, you know, just the first thing you said to me, is like, you're like, Lawrence, I feel pretty down. I hope you get to motivate me. And I was like, oh no, I feel so, I got the spotlight on me. I feel so nervous. And, um, and, and you know, you look at me like, are you still cold calling in the morning? You know, like, it's just yeah. like, I love that you're constantly, you know, every time I connect it, with you. It was a lovely rapport we had, wasn't it? In the morning? Oh yeah. It's yeah. you and me in the office with all the others. That was really lovely. Yeah. And, and the other thing I wanted to share that you used to do is you used to do the little pep talks in the morning. So I don't know, from like, what was it? 7 30 8 a.m you would do like a tony robbins yes or 9 a.m when everyone else got there yeah. i don't know i can't remember um you would do like the tony robbins pep talk you'd read a chapter from the book or a page from the book do you remember doing that as well and i got them to read it as well yeah yeah that's right yeah yeah yeah, yeah, but yeah. It, not everyone was so enthusiastic about it though were they david no <laughs> I mean, not, no you, they're not no you you got 10 people and uh yeah the thing the thing about it you've got 10 people if you just get one person like you that takes it on board, that's satisfying. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I used to love doing that. And then I would like literally try to compete with you to get in the office early to start making cold calls. Obviously, I never beat you. You'd always be there before me. That's because I had a push. Exactly. I had a little beaten up Fox or Astra. Do you remember? Yeah. And do you remember when I first passed my driving test? No. Remember that? You don't remember that? Oh, okay. Well, that was obviously a bigger deal for me. But I remember I was, I was trying to learn to drive because my mum used to drop me off. So she dropped me off at the office and I was 20, I don't know, 22, 23. And, uh, and, and then I started doing my lessons and eventually I passed and I walked in. I was like, guys, I've, I've passed mm -hmm. my test. And you all clapped. Uh, and then I would drive my yeah, beating up little car to, to work every day after that, nervously. Oh. <clears throat> um, so you used to beat me into the office when you had a car then. I, th I think I might have on the odd occasion, but I think you yes. had to open the office, I think. Otherwise, I don't know if I could even get in. I'm not sure. So, yeah. In. What's that? Well, I had the key, so you wouldn't have to go. You well, there you go. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure you were always in there. And I was always trying to impress you. You know, I was like, I always wanted to impress you know, David. Why? And... Why were you trying to impress me? Why? I, back then, David, I just really wanted to be, um, my, my ambition was to be like a successful sales guy or successful business, a person within a business. I wasn't really thinking about being an entrepreneur back then. And so for me, it was like, I wanted to impress you. I wanted to be good by you. You'd taken a chance on me. You'd invested in me. Um, and, I, and you were teaching me and you were in, spending time with me, trying to, make, trying to train me up. 
And I wanted to, I wanted to come good. And obviously there was the incentive, like we'd agreed a compensation structure where if I booked X number of appointments, I'd get paid. And I was motivated to do that. And even though I sucked at it and the basketball, yeah, exactly. And even though I was terrible at it, you kept pushing me and I kept like wanting to overcome the failures, you know? And I, and you know, and it was like, as, as you know, what really, I mean, obviously a lot of stuff sticks with me. But one of the things that I really remember is, um, you know, it wasn't working out for me. It wasn't working out for you, but you didn't want to fire me. You didn't want to let me go. And I remember this really well um, because you, you obviously enjoyed working with me and you were fond of me. Um, and so I got the job at a, a small IT company in London. This is my first job in London. Um, I, got the, I got, the, got the offer, accepted it. And then we sat there, had a meeting and I told you, and you were so happy for me. Yeah, that's good. And, okay. it, and it was it was so nice that you were like so relieved, you know. You want me to cheer you up and tell you a joke? <laughs> go on then. This little boy came home from school and his mum said, How'd you go on in school today? He said, Not very well. They want me back tomorrow. <laughs> a little bit of a joke. See, it made you laugh anyway. It's a bit of a dad joke, David, that one. Yeah, it is, it is, it is a dad joke. <laughs> on Sundays, whenever we um we have a meal over Mel's and the family there. I always get my thing out, and there's a dad joke thing on there. Every tradition <laughs> now, I tell, I play these dad jokes, and they have to remember them one by one. So you've got to remember two dad jokes. That's a tradition that we. we... <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, yeah, and look, I'm not upset. I'm emotional because I'm happy because it's a happy moment. It's it's an inspirational moment to me. It shapes me. You know what? I, I really like getting people upset. Really? No. <laughs> <laughs> So what else? What else? So I really wanted to share that little story there, just because I thought I was really inspirational for me, and obviously I want to show my gratitude to you. Um, but what else? What else should we talk about? I mean, there's, there's so many different avenues we can go down. Um, I mean, I'm I'm really I have a lot of people listening to this, David, who are um, business owners, right? And they go through the trials and tribulations of business and. I just think you've got so much wisdom inside that head of yours about business and self-discipline and motivation. And, and I'm just, I just would love to get into that with you a bit more. Like what, any other kind of thoughts that come to mind, wisdom you'd love to share the, the new entrepreneurs out there? For, young, for new entrepreneurs, yeah. one of the things um, I, always, I always, anybody that I chat to, is always look after the money. Don't go, don't go having flashy offices, spending money on flashy cars, flashing this. Get get a bit of money in, in as a as a backup in because things never go all the way they go up and down all the time so it's like life life goes up it goes down but eventually it goes up if if you're persistent and you and you and you believe in what you're doing you've got you've got a good product um, and one of the other things that I would say is don't listen to negative people because people just love spreading negative ne negative news you know you, you look at the news on the you know, Channel Four especially. I said to my wife, look at that, it's blinking negative, negative. They never said, it was a lovely sunny day today and people really enjoyed their day on the beach and the little children love eating their ice cream. You never see that. It's all, oh dear, look at this, look at this. The world's coming to an end. And China's this and China's that. And right. it's, it's, anyway, it, it, what, what I would advise people to do is, you can't see, but I've got a pile of books. Is keep reading, keep feeding your mind. Um, and also get, get things like, to inspiration, inspire you because you, you look at it and Dale Carnegie is a very, it's very good. Um, it's a good system. How to win friends. Is it? Yeah. A lot of these things now, well, Tony Robbins, you, you've got Tony Robbins and you've got other, other people of that ilk that sort of, but to be honest, a lot of it is, 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 is a lot of them do it for the money. They don't really do it because, um, okay. To meet genuine people, if you like. Okay, I'm a genuine person. Any advice I give to people is not because I want them to do anything or to give me money. It's because, seriously, I, because I've been lucky and I've got a nice life. It's, I say to my wife, because we, we go on the beach, and we sit down and say, look at that lovely, aren't we lucky in life? We've got a lovely big house. And aren't we lucky? We go, aren't we lucky? But if you think of why we're lucky, it's because a lot of it is because we've made our luck. You mm -hmm. know, we've not always been well off. We've not always lived in a nice big house. We've not always... People, look, people, and I look at my gym, and if you see my gym, you think, "What a fabulous place!" I'll, I'll send you a video of it. Please do. 
there's a CrossFit gym on Hailing that's just closed down. And my grandson and his wife, Joe, 37, they've now come into my gym this week to start using it. And I thought, I really love them using my gym, but it's a beautiful gym. I've got all the CrossFit gear and I've got a swimming pool. And this pool, you swim against the current. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, there, and I thought to myself, am I lucky you got all this? And then I think to myself, and people say to me, you're not lucky, you've worked hard. But then I just think I'm lucky. And I'm lucky because I'm lucky. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but you've had, you must have had, like you were said there about peaks and troughs, you must have had failures, but it doesn't oh, sound like you yes, see them as such. Yes. Well, let me give you some examples of that. Yeah. When I was running my, um, which boost business was it now? My juice business. Because I was so keen on expansion, very sort of Walter Mitty-ish, I, wanna, my, I had my juice in all the airports, I had, but I was building up debt to the VAT man. And at one time, I owed three hundred thousand pounds, and I didn't have three hundred thousand pounds. So what do you do? You cave in, or so. What I did, I went to my two suppliers. I went to Mr. Jacobs in Zurich, I went to Mr. Lubinsky in um, in Israel, and I said, "Look, this is the situation." And I was a very oh, going back to the juice business. I started the juice business buying one container, and he said, "Well, you know, you, you're not, you won't be really big." I ended up by being their biggest container, the biggest customer. I was buying 70 can containers a year. Each container was, was 800 cases of six plus one concentrate. As I said to you, every 10 seconds, somebody's already, my, but I was building, 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 but I wasn't looking at the figures. As I was more keen on selling and get, so the debts were building up. So I owed 300 grand to the tax man and they're not very nice people, tax man. So I got these people over and they said, like, okay, what we do, we'll give you the 300,000 pounds. And we, but we do a golden share, so you can't sell the business until you pay it. Well, within 18 months, I'd repaid all the money and I went on to sell the business. So that was pretty scary. And I had the bank manager come because my house was up for security. Um, I had the bank manager come and value in the house for when he was going to repossess it. And that's a bit scary when you've got five kids and you and you go, yeah. yeah. So that was that was, but I'll tell you what, what helped me out a lot. I was very into running then. I used to run and won a lot. I did three London marathons and I did London triathlon. But running that does relieve a lot of the pressure. And, and I used to think, well, I'm going to go for a run now. I used to forget about the back now. And I used to get ideas on the, on the run. So, yeah, yes, you do get, you get everybody's going to get down. Now, the, the secret is, is how you bounce back. Who was it? I think it was um, one of the generals. It's not how hard you fall, it's how quick you bounce back. That one of the which your job, and that's who it was. Uh, and that's key when people are down, there's two ways they can go they can either accept their fate and cave in and get everything to point under, or they can work well, obstacle is the way, or can they, they can work their way up. Now, yeah, that's 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 the way, really. I mean, Jeffers is not doing that well at the moment, I've not had a job on for several months, yeah. Uh, but right, the other one is, is paying my wages and paying well. So I've got various marketing ideas that I'm trying to get back into this. In fact, I got a job on this week for the first time, about several months. Great. And, um, yeah, so I'm really, I'm opting up, I'm going to build this back up again. Yeah. And I don't have to because I can live off the other the other one, but it's a, because Jefferson's is my baby, if you like. People say, why don't you just pack it up? So I'm never going to pack it up. I'm going to rebuild it and start taking two or three people on. I never want to build a big business because the biggest, the big, the t- and, you're lucky in this way. The biggest problem of business is staff. Even, it's even worse now with all these tribunals and stuff like that. I used to, I used to employ rights when I was running my associates. I was running, uh, yeah, as you said, it's a 40, yeah, 40 or 50 people. Yeah. In those days, there wasn't all this wokey stuff around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can, can you imagine it now? I had one occasion when I when I had some I was working for the Southern Electricity Board and I had about fifty tents in a place in one of the girls one of the and, and they wanted to cut back so because they, they had achieved what they wanted to do they decided so we had to make people redundant mm-hmm. so one of the girls that had only been with me a week I said unfortunately um, anyway she took me to tribunal because she was she thought I was um, oh wow no, she no she threatened to take me to tribunal and I said well okay you know. You're the last person off. Anyway, the company, Southern Electric, 
don't let, that, let it happen, pay her off. So I had to go to my, I paid her off. Mm -hmm. But now if I was running a, an employment agency with not only 45 people, uh, there were my employment agents, I had a thousand, 10% out every day, a thousand people out every day. Can you imagine with all this wokeness, all this, or let's sue him, let's, yeah, I would hate that. Yeah. So Tough. I, I don't employ, I don't employ a couple of, of uh, I, uh, freelancers here and Gary's business employs five, uh, plus me. Mm. So I don't want, I don't want, I don't need a, like you, you don't need a lot of people to, to have a successful yeah. business or a successful life. Because why, yeah. why? No, I don't want it. I mean, okay, I don't want to pick a business. I want to build a comfortable business, but I'm happy with um, with really with life, really in general. Great, right, David. Um, yeah, I I I echo your message there about staff. Uh, obviously, there are certain businesses where you know if you're in personal training and your business is about selling human interactions of other humans, yeah. then it's kind of integral. Obviously, yeah. with this online business, I don't need many people. I have very, very amazing uh, contractors that I work with. And Andre, will, <laughs> talking about you primarily. Um, but yeah, it does make the business way easier to run. Obviously, more profitable as well, Alina. Um, so there is a lot of appeal to that, for sure. And I think that's the other thing is we, we kind of in our culture, we sometimes make the mistake of valuing a business based on the head count, like, oh, how many people have you, have you got? Yeah, how big's your team? And it's like, that's actually kind of arbitrary. What matters is obviously what's your profitability, that kind yeah. of thing, you know? Uh, so no, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, David, what are you reading right now? Talking about reading so much. Right, okay. Right. Here we go. Tell you the books. And it's all nonfiction, isn't it? You said earlier. All, it's all, all, all. Yeah. Uh, if, you're, if you were to look at my, I, well, I just, while you're here, I'll, um, the latest books I've, I've bought off Kindle, okay. VO2 Max Essentials, Talk Like Ted, you know the TED Talks? Yeah, sure. Is that Martin Gabala, that first one? Well, who wrote that first one? What is he reading? I don't know. Get rid of him now. So David's currently going for his Kindle. Um, yeah. Ride of a Long of Time, Robert Iger. Okay. Let this optimism. That's so you, Relentless Optimism. One, one book, Outlive the Science of Age of... L longevity. Oh yeah, Peter Attia, very good. Do hard things. Mm -hmm. Become the one percent. The courage to be disliked. I love it. Victory for the fearless. Now this is Dan Kennedy one. The no BS, the ultimate no hards. But I need to. I think you put me on to uh, Dan Kennedy. I'm starting to think you were the one because I, I love his Stephen stuff. Pressfield. He's a good. Yeah. Guess what. Marcus Aurelius Martin, man, man, Meditations, man. yeah. <laughs> That's a great one. This is a good one. Peter Tia He's a good boy you want to follow. Peter Tia And I'll live the science of longevity. Seneca, the shortness of life. Life is long if you know how to use it. That's a great one. I've read that, yeah. Tactical density training. Right, I'll go back. To the, I'll go back to some. The and are you, di are you dipping into, how do you read these? You dip into them in and out of each one or do you read one all the way through? Oh, I dip in. I bet to. Now, the next line is the power of discipline. Mm -hmm. The chat GPT millionaire. Are you using that? Are you using chat GPT? The fitness. I mustn't tell you that. No, that's fine. It's amazing. That GPT. I use it all the time, David. I, I used it to create that bio I read for you today. Oh, did you? Oh. That's why you were so impressed by it. Because I took, I took your, I literally copy and pasted your LinkedIn, put in chat GPT and write, said, write a great podcast bio for David, David Pike. Really? That was brilliant. Yeah. yeah. 5 a.m. revolution, that's Robin Sharma. That's getting up at 5 a.m. and doing all those different things. Yeah. Must the emotions. Breakout trading, that's the, um, Amazing. You look at all my reading list, that people think he's a bit of a nutter. Look at all the stuff he's got on there. Yeah. <laughs> and I hope you don't mind me saying this, David, but I think this is important for context. You are 84 years old, chronologically. Obviously, that's not your physiological age. Don't tell too many people that, otherwise I won't get all those dolly birds onto me. <laughs> but um, I just think I think the thing that really resonates oh, to me, oh, David. Go ahead. Yeah. My goal is to live to 128. 128. Love it. But the thing is, like, I just I've never met anyone who's just still so much energy, so inspired, so motivated at your age. I just I don't oh, you don't see it. It's it's a it's it's a rare. My wife says you got to get out a bit. <laughs> 
Speak to more 84 year olds. <laughs> well, listen, 84 year olds near where you live in Ireland, they're quite a healthy lot. Uh, I don't know. Uh, perhaps compared to other places, yes, probably, because it is a more quite active uh, spot, I guess. Uh, yeah, but if I was 60, I would still be the same. If I was 40, I was still. Well, you, I don't know. You, you're exactly the same. Exactly the same as I remember. You have an age today. And that's 14 years. years yeah. Well, even 30 years before you met me, I was still the same. Right. I'm still the water mitty that wants to learn how to kick sand in people's faces. Yeah. <laughs> so what, 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 what's like uh, you said about living to 128? What's your vision for your future? Like, do you, do you envisage starting multiple businesses? Like, what do you think you're going to do going from here? I suppose I would like to get into the, into the, into the, so fitness business is not, it's not the word. I suppose it's into the motivational longevity. I'd like to get hold of a group of people I could influence. Like you tell, I've influenced you. Which sure. To me, I've influenced you and your mates, whatever. And many people. Uh, instantly, can you get one of those? Tell me where to get one of those Spartan things. I could put that on my desk as well. Yeah, I'll ask you where you got it from. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, it's to spread the word, of the knowledge that I've got on fitness and longevity and health and fitness. To, I suppose, I don't know whether I'd want many people or just maybe 20 people that become, but the, the same way, I don't really want the commitment to be constantly churning stuff out. Um, I've got all the stuff in my head of what I want. Like you, I could, I could, like, you already know a lot of the stuff that I, that, that I know anyway. Maybe there's a bit of stuff that I know that maybe you don't know or you're interested to know, but Maybe a group, a small group of people that would look on me as a guru that I could inspire and, and help them get healthy. Because as you and I know, health is the most important thing that, and family as well. Health is the most important thing you can have. Whether, yeah. you, whether you've got money, you haven't got money, you need to be healthy. Fit, and you need to be a positive frame of mind because positivity goes a long way. You know, you, you see people, I would say, oh, they bloody would cheer up. Um, <laughs> I can't tell them that because that's negative. Yes. Right, right. Got to inspire them to cheer up. Yeah. Right. And getting out of the chair, we can't do that, we can't do that. Then suddenly they can do it. They think, oh, blimey, look at that. Wendy, my wife, has inspired me to do that. So that would be my goal. That's my goal. I, was, I go, thing is, thing is, Lawrence, I'm happy what I'm doing. I'm happy getting on my bike, cycling three or four miles down there in the morning. It was raining this morning, sitting here, going through all my 150 emails, trying to drum business for Jefferson Maguire. Talking to various marketing persons. I've got this girl in, but it's wonderful, as you know, but I've got this girl in, this woman, this guy in um, India in Hyderabad. He's doing some good marketing for me. I've got this girl in Pakistan writing lovely blogs for me. I've got this girl I've just come across in Albania. She's doing some, some media marketing for me. This is all for Jefferson Maguire, right? All these this, this right. freelancers. I've got, no, I'm doing nothing for the fitness business. Uh, we've got other groups of people doing it for Right International. The new website coming out tomorrow. Yeah, it's it, live tomorrow. Have a look at it when you see it. It's really, really nice. I'm excited. Did you self, did you, how did you hire these people? Did you use like Upwork or what websites did you use for that? I've got, got a couple of them. Either. So I just want to take a moment to say, like, David, it was fair for me to say this. You are not exactly the most techno technologically advanced human being, right? Like, no, not, no, not the most. No. You're not, you're right, right. And, and you taught yourself how to use Fiverr and how to hire people through that service. Yeah. And it's like, I know so many people, entrepreneurs who, who, yeah, I'm not technical. I can't do that. And I'm like, well, look, if David can do it, and I, I, don't, I mean that like a, a, a backhand and compliment, I guess, oh, um, no. then there really is no excuse to, 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 not, to not learning this stuff. Just a short story. When I, when I sold my um, juice business, I took a year off um, and I wanted to learn, and, and, and I'm, I'm an Apple, Apple fan. I, I bought one of the first Apple Macs over here, and I had an Apple Mac. And I wanted to learn how to do spreadsheets, but I never knew how to spreadsheet. Now, at the time, Excel wasn't on Macs. It was a, it was a watch thing. Then Mac, Mac bought a thing called Jazz, which subsequently turned into Excel. So I stayed at home, and I learned Jazz that come Excel. And I, I'm a whiz kid at Excel. I, I do every single day. My first, I, I, I've got Excel spreadsheets, forecasts. So I, I mastered that. When I knew nothing about it, and that, because I sat down, and I really anybody can sit down and master anything. And I think the thing is, you let you let the years go by. I think, 
one that guy, the person you, you became, the person you could have become. That's, that's a very true thing to have. And I'll look at that every single day, as well as the Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama, my kid bought me, my, Indi my, uh, my, my, my Spanish grandson bought that yes. when he went to India. Never give up on a long thing. He actually is now, last week, went to India to a, re to a retreat, to a yoga retreat, because he got inspired by guess who? You? The Dalai Lama. Oh. Well, me and the Dalai Lama. <laughs> Who's the Dalai Lama anyway? <laughs> That's all that. So you asked my ambition. My ambition is just to be financially comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, when I saw, when I saw, my, maybe you don't want to put this on me. When I sold my business, my first thing is what can I do for my kids? So I sold my business and I got a few million quid for it. So I, I bought, I paid the mortgage off my house. I bought a house next door, which my mum and dad had, and my mum died, unfortunately. So I bought that. And um, I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll do, have an Easter egg hunt. You know, Easter egg hunts with kids, you put eggs around the thing. Yeah. So yeah. I took all my kids around, including my daughter in, in Spain. I said, come over, got a special Easter egg hunt. So what we did, what I did, I had an Easter egg hunt, but instead of an egg, it was an envelope. And inside was a check. Uh -huh. I hid it all around, all around the garden, and they bought it. I said, okay, go out and have to, but when you find it, can't, don't open your envelope. So it took ages to, to open for them to find it, They're climbing up trees. Anyway, they all, five of them came around. They sat in the lounge. I said, wait, well, you can open them now. 25,000 pounds. Wow. Is, How old were they at this, this point? Well, it was 1998, so that's all those years ago. Okay. I did that three years running. Oh, wow. Okay. And I also, I bought them all a car. I bought yeah, we, very generous. <laughs> so, and I thought, now, would I do that again? Yes, I would do it again. Um, do that. But the thing is, it's not, I'm not sure they all appreciate it, to be honest, because there is a thing called tough love. Now, I've made yes. it quite easy for some of my kids. Um, tough love, which is uh, Alex. Ferguson, the way he ran Manchester United, mm. he was really tough. But underneath, he was a softie. Um, mm. I think that's a lesson to when, when you kids. I think with your kids, you got you got to make them. You got to make them earn. You got to make them earn their way. You shouldn't yeah. make them make their way smooth because, and I think they should struggle. I got a I've got a grandson in Barney. He's a little devil, but he's a he's almost. Kind of favorite kids, but when he when I was when he was three, I had my hip replacements, and he used to come into the into the and I and he used to sit on my bed. And he was three, he's twenty one now, and he's working as a laborer, and he has to he has to motor sort of thirty miles every day. And I thought I could make his life easier, but I won't because that's a lesson he's learning. Get up in the morning at five o'clock, going, and I think to make kids earn their way is that is that even if you can make it easy. It's not, the lesson I've learned. It's probably best if you don't. You okay. got you're there as a backstop, but I would suggest that to, to make it. I mean, I, I've done it the wrong way. I've 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 given my kids like, like these three treasure hunts. Sure. Although it's lovely to do it, um, and I, I probably would do it again. But <laughs> all the kids that I've got, I think tough love is is, is quite important to have. I hear what you're saying. It's difficult, right? It's that you hear, I hear about this all the time. People that have generated wealth, made money. It's the hardest thing because you want to spoil, you want to help your family, but are you really helping them? Right? It's uh, it's a more enabling, isn't it? It's it, yeah. I, I I think you're right. I think um, I love balance. the way it's, it's a balance, right? I love what you said there. As a it's like you're a backstop. You're like last resort safety yeah. net. I think that is more. It's probably yeah. a better strategy. It sounds like yeah. What saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think because I see these people, they buy their kids a twelve, uh, the latest iPhone. I think. Yeah. Do they need the latest iPhone? They, yeah. they want because their kids at school have got the latest iPhones, and uh, once again, they're not buying because they want it. They want to buy because they're impressing their other people. Yeah. My missus put it quite a nice way. She said she never wants our kids wanting for anything. Like they're, you know, they're they've yeah. got the things they need and want, etc. But they're not like spoiled with loads of stuff. We, we have a phrase in our family, oh, well, I invented it. Families that play together, stay together. I encourage all my, my, I've got a grandson, Joe, he's 37. 
And again, I've been his mentor as well. Um, mm -hmm. He's got three, three little kids and they're two crossfitters. They, I've inspired him to do crossfit. Um, but they brought, they brought this motor home and they go out to the new forest and they park, they camp overnight and they came around in the gym. Have you ever heard of a game called Rummy Cup? I haven't, no. It's a really, it's, it's a lovely game. Anyway, they came around in the garden. Uh, Noah, who's 11, India, who's six, and she likes, she's coming to Rummy Cup. We sat in the lounge playing Rummy Cup. My wife was a little friend. We were sitting around here playing Rummy Cup and the parents were in the gym working out. And I did say, it's families that play together, stay together. That's true. But you've got to, you've got to get involved with your kids and, because the thing is about your kids, and you'll find this out, when they get to about, they need you and want you most of it, up until they get to about 13. Mm. And then they get their mates, they tend not to want you. And they start, they start, if you're like, oh, go away, dad, go away, mum, I want this, I've got to do this, I've got to get on my phone, blah, 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 blah. But then they come back to you when they're sort of 18 or 19. But that period of time could be quite hurtful in a way because you've played, you've played about 10, 11 years of your life into their life, then suddenly they turn and they think, I don't want, I'm not saying anything, but that's my experience. Yeah, I hear that a lot. I hear that a lot, yeah. One big, one big group of family. We, yeah. We've got a wedding in, we've got a wedding in, my, my Spanish grandson is marrying his lovely wife. They've got a lovely little boy called Rio, who's just about a year old in Valencia. And the whole family's going to Valencia for their wedding in October. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, so do you think when they hit 13, it's still, so we have a few rituals that we try and do every day. Like we, we always said, we want to have breakfast and dinner together every single day. Obviously that might change when the kids get older and they have like sporting activities that might clash with that time, but we want to try and do dinner as often as we possibly can and always do breakfast as a family. Now, when they hit 13, what do you recommend at that point? Do you think you still, do you still kind of enforce that? Hang on. We always do that as a family. You still try and do what you're doing. Yeah. And if you're playing sport, obviously you go and support their sport and go and watch them play whatever. Yeah. That's, that's quite a bonding thing too. All my grandkids play sport and their parents go and watch their matches. Yep. Um, you know, teenagers uh, typically, they get their hormones and all sorts of things get into their mind. And, and of course, all this social media stuff, which I think is terrible, the way it influences kids negatively. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there should be there should be much more control over social media. There should be. Hopefully, it might come eventually. Unfortunately, it's there, and, and their kids and they value their they value their peers, if you like, friendship more than their parents uh, at some stage. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Tell me just before we start wrapping up, Dave. We're gonna wrap up in a bit, but tell me, I'd love to just hear like more about your routines. Like you talked there about your diet, how you okay. eat, how you fast one day a week, how you I, eat I breakfast. Daily, Please thought, do. Well, okay. I get up, I get up, it's just come six o'clock. Mm -hmm. We sit down and have a cup, couple of cups of tea with my wife and watch the morning news. I get on my bike about seven o'clock, five past seven. Come around, come around to the office. Nobody comes until nine o'clock, so I'm here on my own. So I'll go through my thing. First thing I have in the morning is a cup of green tea. Green tea. Then I don't have anything at all. Uh, except maybe in a minute I might have that apple. And then sometimes I mix protein mix before I go home. Then I go home and I go in the gym. Most, most of us are going in the gym. And I, I, I tend to do cardio work. I should, another thing, as you age, you must do, I've lost Absolutely. a lot of strength because I've, I've and I'm so, so oh, going to try and get more strength. So I'm doing weight training. No, got to do strength training, David. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. weight training is yeah, is quite hard. I've got a pull up. I've got a pull up bar here. So I pull up, and I can't do one pull up at the moment. And I've only do about three press ups. So, I injured my shoulder twice falling off the bike, and I've got a broken collarbone. So that's my excuse. But Maybe invest in some nice like uh, machines that make it easier for you to do, you know, basic strength training movements so that you don't hurt yourself. But you, you can do light weights. I mean, I, I know. I know I can use light weights. Sure. Uh, I'll tell you the thing I didn't t took too lightly L last year was rucking. Have you heard of rucking? Uh, yeah, so this is obviously a Peter Atia inspire, inspired you with that probably, didn't he? Oh, he no? got inspired by the guy. He inspired me. We the book. I thought you were going to say you, he got inspired by you. 
Oh, he got inspired by the guy that I, he's an ex-Marine guy that wrote the book. Oh, okay. Rocking. I didn't know he was into rucking because I get his podcast quite regularly. It's, yeah. it's wearing a rucksack with weights on your back. So I got this rucksack. You can't really buy a really decent rucksack. I got my grandson in New York to bring it up last year. And then I got these, I got these weights. Mm -hmm. Now, in America, you can buy the weights, but they're so expensive to send across. So I got this company called Mirafit. They make a weight which is about that big, which is too big to slot into the back of the rucksack. Mm -hmm. So I've got this blacksmith friend that I've had for years. He's made out gates. So he cut the top off. So I think it's 15 kilos at the moment. Is it 50? No, it's not. It's 20 kilos at the moment. Yeah. He's cut, he's cut five kilos off. So I've not been rucking since I've done my, my leg. But I used to go rucking almost every day, walking up for two hours along the beach with this rucksack on my back, oh, yeah. uh, which is very, very good. Now, Petia got onto it. He read about it. He read me doing it, so Petia Petia got onto it. But one's probably reading about me. That's a joke. But he writes very sensible work. And he has these podcasts like you do, yeah. with the top, top-notch guys about longevity, about various things. And he's written that book, which I've got. Tony Robbins has written a book, which also I've got about longevity. Um, yeah. Life Force, is it, or something? Yeah. You know. Yeah, I've heard about that. But if you if you analyze all the bits and pieces out of it, I try and take what I think the best. Anyway, so I, I got so I go to work in the morning, have a green tea, don't maybe eat that apple. Maybe before I go home, I go home between one and two. Can have a mix before I go home, and I go in the gym and do generally an hour, uh, generally an hours an hours workout on the bike or combination of the treadmill, the rower, and the, the what's the name bike. Then I got this pool which. It, it's not heated. I use it a cold dip because I'm very into very into to the Wim Hof's cold, cold. Oh yeah. As well, go into that. Then luckily I've got a sauna, so I go into the sauna for twenty minutes, and then I go, I go indoors, and then I, um, I do have something to eat. I have a, what I've lately is peanut butter sandwich. Then in the evening, Lovely. a salad or yeah, either salad or a healthy meal. That, that's Sounds not great. Really, thank really. And Sounds read, like a beautiful day. I read. I read most days. I read something most days, but I get I get emails and I get all these different things. I preach with tears. I send and I read. Well, I read him sort of twenty minutes. I listen to him for twenty minutes. Yeah. So my 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 day, if you like, it might sound a bit boring to lots of other people. Not at all. But I fill my mind full of positivity and things new. What's new? What can I do? Like, I bought. You've heard of Pavel, haven't you? The, the, yeah, Pavel Satsulin. Yeah. I was reading about him years and years ago. Kettlebells were not available in England then. There was not, not one kettlebell in England. I went to Florida on Virgin, I'd lucky I went to Virgin Atlantic, upper class, and I ordered a kettlebell to go to my hotel in, in, uh, <laughs> in, in um, near Tampa Beach. Okay. I got this kettlebell, I put it in my luggage. And I How got heavy my, was this kettlebell? It was 16 kilos, the basic okay. number. Which is sixteen kilos. I got on the, I got on the um, on the plane, Virgin Atlantic, up across. Mister Pike, will you please come to this? I thought I've seen the bloody kettle, but I think it's a bomb. I said, Why could you undo your case, please? I said yes. They didn't they ignore the kettlebell. Right. It was a tube of these these things that pump up your tires, these gas cylinders. He said, you're not allowed to take that, I'm afraid. So I had to get rid of the gas cylinder. But I bought a kettlebell back. And I believe That's it's the first kettlebell ever in the UK. Oh, wow. Really? Wow. I got this blacksmith friend of mine to make some little copies of it. And then kettlebell, of course, became all the rage. Mm -hmm. And every, you can buy kettlebells. I've got kettlebells now here, about 10 quid a time at Lillings or Aldi. So yeah. can, I, can I give you another book to read, if you don't mind? Have you read Body by Science by Dr. Doug McGough? Have you read that? No, Body by Science. Body by Science. Do you read it, David? I think you'll love it. Sinclair, is it? What's that? It's not a guy called Sinclair. No, not David Sinclair. You're thinking of the longevity scientist yeah. guy. This Body is a. Uh, yeah. 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 Like, so my audience are laughing now, probably hearing me say that because um, that book is fundamental to this whole podcast. It's a book all about exercise and strength training as it relates to healthy aging and metabolic health, et cetera, et cetera. But I think you'll find it very inspiring. He didn't use to work for me, did he? No, no, no. Why? My ideas. Your ideas. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see. Well, it doesn't sound like you're doing enough strength training, David. I'm worried about your muscle yeah, mass. I'm coming back to it because 
like down about those kettlebells. I used to do regularly. Yeah. I've got a tennis court, luckily. I had to go to the tennis court and I used to do 10 reps with each arm. Yeah. Now I can't do one. Like, yeah, I'm, but the reality is, David, they're ballistic and they, they're, there's more injury risk with kettlebells, yeah, right? I know, but it is, I, I know I've got to do it. And that's my weakness. And the whole of my armory is my weakness. Yeah. But I do know it. If I'd have known about it 20 odd years ago, they got, I'd stuck more to get because I've I done so many aerobics oh. and triathlons and big marathons and so much. That's all I need to my knee. I've got two new knees and two mm -hmm. new hips. Yeah. But what I, I, have you, okay. Are you familiar with Clarence Bass? You, you must know him. I've got all his books. Yeah. He's, um, he's a high, he's a, he's a strength training guy, but a safe strength training guy. Yeah. So he would strength train, you know, he would do uh, chest presses and rows, but slowly to muscle failure. So he's not putting any of his joints he's at any risk. Books. Right. Okay. Yeah. Ripped, right. His book <laughs> yeah. series ripped. Yeah. But he's not, he's getting all the benefits from strength training, but he's not exposing himself to any yeah, injury risk. The problem with CrossFit and kettlebells and a lot of those exercises is they're just a little bit more risky, more likely to get injured. So for yourself, I think you'll be, you'd be better off with more sort of, and that's the stuff I do. Right. That type of safe strength training. Not to spend hours doing my, I know, I know, I'm aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just got back into doing a few bench presses. And I, now I've got the thing here, and I've got some sandbags, and I do clean, I do clean and jerks, and I do right rows. And what I do, oh, okay. I want to tell you, what I do every day, I do a hundred kettlebell swings. I've got a twenty-five kg kettlebell out there, and I do hundred of those every day, five sets of twenty. And okay. I do, and every time I do, I do twenty-five of those. Then I do ten upright rows with the with the kettlebell, and. Um, I'll tell you what, I've also started with doing, I've been doing wall, wall sits lately. Beautiful. Like, Great two, exercise. Two minute wall sits. Um, and at the end Let's of the Let's go back to your isometrics, right? I go right down low. And I have a job to get up after two minutes. I've got a clock in, and I do it in competition with two people that work here. And we sit there with it. I'm always the last one. Well, she's probably what to guess. <laughs> well, that's great to hear you doing that. David, I, I really enjoyed this. I've got to start wrapping up. But any, any, okay. sort of, any sort of final thoughts from yourself you want to share to either the fitness enthusiasts or the business owners or uh, words of inspiration, anything like that? Well, fitness people, I would, I would say that you, you've got to maintain your fitness and you've got to do it. And little and often is the, is, little and often is the, is the message that I would give, give to people, but never stop doing it. Never, never stop doing it. And always stretch yourself a little bit more, a little bit more. Because you you can do a lot more than you believe you can, yeah. And when you when you get to one space, you get on it. Entrepreneurs, business owners, the, the key thing, the, the number one key thing, as as you experienced when you work for me, is to develop a motivated team. Because you can't do apart from what you're doing. If your building is like me, you can't do it on your own. You need people around you. Now these days you can get freelancers, which help you a certain degree. But the key. Is to have a team around you that you can make, that think and want to want to work, not just for the money, but want to work because they 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 like working for you, and you do all sorts of things. You don't do cheesy things, but you like all sorts of nice. Like I bought you a basketball. I didn't buy you a basketball because I think oh, if I had one, Lawrence is going to do more cold calling in the morning. I bet if I give him a basketball, <laughs> I bought you a basketball because I thought you deserved it, and that's <laughs> something you like. Yeah, so it's yeah. motivating your team in nice. Genuine ways is a, is a key thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody that's listening to this, just give us some jobs and I'll help you motivate your team. I love it. Yeah, that's great, great words of wisdom. Okay. Lawrence, it's been a long time coming because I've sort of put you off, haven't I? For a long no, time. I actually think you, I actually, uh, I failed you last time. I think we did actually schedule a call like a few years back and then yeah, I just yeah. had a baby. I, I thought I wimped out of it. I didn't whip out of it. I thought, no, 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 it was my fault because I oh. had a baby and I, I had to cancel it. And then you said to me, because I said, look, I've got, a I was living in a smaller flat at the time. I had a five month old and it was noisy, obviously. Oh, yeah. And you, noisy. and you said to me, you, yeah, you said to me, oh, you should use this software that will help to reduce the noise or something like that. And that's yes. where we left it. And I just, I just forgot. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's been yeah. a pleasure talking to you. Let's keep the relationship going. Not Absolutely. Yet, but let's keep. To in and from and messages and stuff like that. Tell me Definitely. where to get the Spartan from. The, yeah, no, I will. I will. I made a note. Um, David, final words for me. Just really appreciate you making the time. 
massive inspiration to me. I think about our, I think about my time with you a lot. It was so unique. And a lot of what I experienced after did not come close. Like I worked for a lot of people after you, and Lovely. I was surrounded by a lot of people that just did nothing for me and weren't that inspirational and were actually a negative influence. And it's you're a rare jewel. You're you know, it, it, it's I was very fortunate to be exposed to you. It's um, and it I don't really believe in. Uh, you know, destiny and fate. I kind of just felt I was just very lucky to fall know. into that position. But I, I heard about you and I was attracted to that and I went for it. I didn't sit back and go, well, that's nice. I was like, no, I want to meet this guy, you know, and I'm so glad I did. Oh, it's nice. Nice. Well, well, I'll play your podcast and maybe I can play it to a few of my friends and whatever. I'd love that. I've inspired along the way. Maybe I'll let them hear the podcast. And they maybe they think I'm showing off if I say all the things I've done. Ah, uh, well, you, you're entitled to it at this stage, David. So David, best, well, sorry, what's the best place for people to find out about you? Do you want to drop the, the, the domains, the websites, that kind of thing? For people to contact you. Jeffersonmcguire.co.uk. Mm -hmm. My email is david at jeffersonmcguire.co.uk. Great. And, that, and obviously I'm on LinkedIn. And you've got executorwarrior.fitness as well. People want to learn about that. Um, but there might be some capacity issues in the beginning. Yeah. You wanted to just let people yeah. know. Because <laughs> you're so I'll, popular. Maybe I'll give advice from you on how best to just to sort of dabble, dabble in that. Happy to help. Happy to help. Um, so with all that said, for everyone listening, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Uh, and to get the show notes for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com. Search for episode 434. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. Let's go, let's go. Welcome to another episode brought to you by Imagine Strength, the future of safe, simple, and effective high-intensity training equipment. Are you a hit studio owner looking for equipment that's not just top-notch, but also tailored to your specific needs? Imagine Strength is your answer. Inspired by the legendary Arthur Jones, Imagine Strength is revolutionizing the hit industry with their state-of-the-art yet affordable equipment. Their team doesn't just sell hit equipment, they live and breathe it. I've personally experienced their gear at the Resistance Exercise Conference, and let me tell you, it was an intense workout that I won't soon forget, in the best way possible, of course. So why choose Imagine Strength? Number one, they provide customized solutions for hit studios. Number two, they have budget-friendly yet high-performance designs. And number three, they're committed to innovation and excellence in high-intensity training specifically. Founder Jeff Turner and his dedicated team are on a mission to make HIT accessible to everyone. Getting started is easy. Number one, visit imaginestrength.com. Number two, consult with their expert team. And number three, choose the equipment that will skyrocket your business. Don't wait. Head over to imaginestrength.com and elevate your HIT studio today with Imagine Strength. Imagine Strength.